beside me and he started kicking him violently to see, to make sure there was no sign of life and firing and he came over to me and uh, I just kept my face pressed down into the ground and pretended to be dead. I didn't, just didn't make a sound. I feel the same way, you know. I uh, I didn't uh, ask to engage with the, the troubles. The troubles engaged with me. I didn't make war on anyone. Britain made war on me. And what you didn't see in the documentary when you watch that is that, you know, there were other people there, not on camera, that were making sure that this was, you know, this was going to go uh, a certain way. I, was, I spent Christmas looking at, I, I read 14,000 files from our case over Christmas. Thank you very much for joining me, Stephen. I, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, we, we'll get into um, we, we'll get into the 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 incident itself, the the aftermath, and so on. Um, but can, can you give us a bit of an idea of of how you came to to join the band and just like a, a bit of what your life was like previous to um pre previous to, to to this this horrific incident? Like, well, um, uh, I was uh, uh interested in music always. Uh, Props because I was because I was lazy and uh, it's something that I didn't have to work very hard at. Um, and the music came very easy. Um, played guitar for a while when I was a kid, from maybe about the age of started to play guitar, but when I was about eleven. Um, but there was a lot of very good players around our area. I came from Carrick and Shore in South Tipperary, which is. Uh, uh, very south, uh, as far south as you can go, on the borders of Waterford and Kilkenny. So if you're into sport, it was hurling country. Um, and uh, the two great passions were, actually, were hurling and, and and music. And then, of course, with Sean Kelly came along and he's a world champion cyclist. So cycling was big and I was into cycling as well. The music was the easiest thing I ever did in my life. I couldn't believe anybody would pay me for doing it, you know, so... Uh, as a guitar player, I was okay. Um, I had very good technique, technically very good. But what I was playing uh, on guitar, um, there was some, just something that uh, wasn't right. Couldn't figure it out until a, a, a neighbor of mine one, one day asked me if I'd consider playing bass in his band in a, in a group. And all of a sudden, I discovered that what I was actually playing, no matter how fast I played, it was I was thinking like a bass player. So when I got him, uh, got the bass guitar and started to play with the band, it was like life changer, game changer for me. It was totally natural. And um, over the over the the next few years, once I got got to understand the the role of the bass guitar in 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 in, in a band. Um, I said my reputation grew. So I was um, big fish in a small pond around around the area, and um, then I, I started to test myself. And I would do uh, I would do uh, go for auditions with bands, and I didn't even want the job just to see if I was good enough to get them, you know. And then I, I'd, I'd say I couldn't take it or whatever, you know. And I was still at school, um, and. Um, I went to after 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 I finished. I had been playing with with, with a few bands. I played with a, a, a couple of beat groups at the time. That I suppose today you'd call them rock rock groups or rock bands. Uh, and at that time, you would have had music. The popular music at the time was would have been sort of like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Kings, the Animals, uh, John Mayall's Blues Breakers, all that type of thing. I was particularly interested in the blues. And I was also uh, very interested in, in jazz. So in order to play in a pop band, you really had to get out of that mindset. You had to, you, you had to you, uh, sort of listen to what was happening. And there's, there's, you know, there's no such thing as pop music. It's, it's, what, it's what's popular at the time. It's just like jazz. There's no such thing as jazz. It's what you feel at the time. So, um, so even today, you know, I would, uh, I would, encourage any young bass players or drummers if they're if, if they're watching this yeah, to for a while to play in what I always call a pure style country music is, is very good to teach you what 
what you, the role of the of the of the instrument. Uh, reggae is also very very good, and blues is very good, and they teach you, you know, wh where you should be in music. And then, uh, of course, because country and pop and all of these things were popular, my reputation grew, and eventually, eventually, I started get calls from offers to you know to 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 join uh, bands, pop really popular bands, uh, and uh, turn them all down mostly. You know, I'd go and do the audition and then say I couldn't take it. But uh, and then the my Anne and I got married and. Uh, so I decided, well, I had better pay the mortgage. And uh, so I decided, in my arrogance, I decided uh, I, I'll, I'll join a big band. And uh, so when the Miami offered me a job in 74, um, I went and I met them. And uh, instead of offering me the bass player job, uh, they actually offered me the lead guitarist jobs, which I turned down. I didn't want it. Uh, as I say, two different animals. The guitar player and a bass player, two different things. It's like, you know, getting a plumber to fix your electricity. It doesn't work, you know. So um, so they came back again uh, the following year. That was offered me the first first time in Miami I offered me the job was in September 74. We weren't long married. And then, then they came back in May, at the end of May in 75. And I, I took that job then. I needed to pay my mortgage, which was seven pounds a week. <laughs> I'm sorry, remind me, what, what year were you born and what, what age are you? I, when I, you, when I, you I, was, I was born in 51. So when I joined the Miami, I was, uh, I was, I was 24. Uh, when they offered me the job the first time, I was 23. But I had been playing in lots and lots of different bands. I was playing in pop and blues and rock bands and all sorts of things. Uh, just getting the chops together, uh, but the Miami was a big, big gig, and it was paying good money, you know. So, uh, and they were they were also they were fabulous. Uh, I think what people forget as well is that by the time I joined them, because that band was set up in in 1962, 63, and I would have been about eleven at that stage. So, but they changed uh, the personnel. Over the years, people left and the, the band changed. And by the time I joined, they had dropped the name show and they were simply called the Miami uh, because Miami was a, in Ireland was a, a very valuable brand. At the same time, show band was sort of old fashioned and they had a great singer with them who had been like me. He had been in the beat groups and called Fran O'Toole. And... Um, also, they had a phenomenal guitar player called Tony Garrity, who had, who had been in a very heavy rock scene. Um, uh, people, people like uh, Rory Gallagher and Gary Moore and people like that were big, big fans of Tony Garrity. Uh, in fact, Rory Gallagher gave him his AC30 amp, um, and Gary Moore never missed a gig when Tony was playing with the with the heavy bands. But like me, he, you know, he wanted to settle down. He'd been touring around Europe and he wanted to pay the mortgage, get married and that type of thing. So he he joined the money, which is what I did. Um, I was going to ask you there. Um, OK, so so you, you were obviously you were about mid 20s when you joined and the troubles themselves, this this era that, that you unfortunately ended up getting caught up and I guess started about about kind of 69 yeah about 1969 so it'd been going about four or five years at this stage for, for you was it was it something you kind of had much awareness would, would, would it have been something you followed um you know in newspapers or on the news did, did, did it feel like it was like, like a world away or no I had no interest in it whatsoever like like so many of my uh, of, of of the people that lived in the in, in the republic I was happy in my ignorance. I was happy in, uh, you know, just that the north, the north of Ireland may as well have been the North Pole, you know, and th and that is uh, that's the way we were thinking to our great shame, you know, uh, that that we uh, that that we weren't interested in this. I remember when when the troubles really started to kick off. I should say sixty nine. I was working in, I was working in London uh, in the financial uh, city in what they call the city of London, which is the financial city. Uh, it's that square mile 
uh, where all the business is done. And I remember when the trouble started to, uh, at the beginning of 69, when they started to be reported on the paper and the news and people would say, what's oh, terrible, what's happening, you know, back home. I would say, well, you know, it's, it's, I'm a million miles away from that, you know, uh, it, it's not happening in my, my, but little did I know that in uh, six years afterwards, you know, that it would, I often think of, um, uh, of what Malcolm X said uh, when he somebody mentioned Plymouth Rock. Rock, he said, "My people didn't land on Plymouth Rock like the people from the Mayflower." You know that he said, "My people didn't la land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on me." Well, I feel the same way. You know, I uh, I didn't uh, ask to engage with the the troubles. The troubles engaged with me. I didn't make war on anyone. Britain made war on me. Oh, sorry, w w was the band, uh, w was the band known for for playing like like all around the country? I I, I know people w w when you hear about it, you you hear about it as a band that, that had no problem like playing to Catholics or, or Protestant audiences, but 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 that would have just existed kind of in the north. W w w was it w was it all around the country that the band used to play? Well, first of all, the band was made up of Catholics and Protestants and from guys from the north and the south. There were three people. There was a six piece band. When I was when I joined, three of them were from the north, and uh, three from the south. There was, uh, the northern lads. There was uh, there was two Protestant lads, Brian and 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 Ray, the drummer and the trumpet player, and uh, and a Catholic from the north. And then down south, um, obviously I was Catholic. And Fran Fran O'Toole is Catholic, and Tony Garrity from Dublin, who's a Catholic as well. But you know, I never knew what religion they were until after they were dead. It, it, it didn't matter to us. And I never once ever heard, we were based in Dublin, but I never once heard politics or religion or anything like that, you know, mentioned. And there was never a discussion about that. The closest it ever came would be, obviously, when I joined, uh, I joined at the end of May. So I, I, we hit the ground running uh, in June of 75, and then which brought us into July and that's the marching season in the north when, when the blood comes up and, you know, there are people, there there are, there's a lot of uh, very, very uh, sort of volatile uh, activity there around that time. So the only, the closest I ever came to hear anything about politics was when the lads would say, you know, if we're on our way to one particular place in the north, they'd say, uh, we better avoid that town because there's a march on today so we could get stuck in the traffic or, or something like that. Other than that, we had no interest and where we played was you know, to, to Catholics and Protestants. It, the, the, one, the one great thing about, about the bands, and we didn't know it at the time, was that we were actually um, we were uh, peacemakers. Now, that, that sounds sort of grandiose to say that. And we had no idea. We wouldn't have even known about the meaning of that word. But because we played to Catholics and Protestants and because the ballrooms and the dance halls and the marquees that we played in would have had mixed audiences. It was the one place that audiences could go and leave the troubles and sectarianism and all that outside the door. Um, and so it was it was an oasis for anyone. And also the, the thing is, you know, you, a young Catholic boy would see a young Protestant girl or a young Protestant boy see a young Catholic girl. And nature took its course. You know, so, and they, they discovered, you know, that people didn't have horns. You know, they didn't have, they didn't, they weren't demons and as they probably had been led to believe from their own communities. So we were, we were doing something special, although we had no idea that we were doing that. Uh, and um, perhaps that was one of the reasons that that uh, sinister uh, forces thought, you know, well, we'd be better off without these fellas. Okay, yeah, that that, that brings us up to um, that brings us up to the, of course, the 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 famous night in question. Um, can you um, uh, can you give us an idea of of what it was like, maybe the just the, the just your time in the band up until that incident. Well, as I say, we hit the ground running in uh, in start of June, and um, it was it was different than any other band that I had played in. Um, 
you know, obviously it was it was huge. I suppose because there wasn't the type of distraction that you have today. You know that young people will have uh, other things to do, and there's there's the internet and there's uh, uh, lots of things. But at that time, you had one radio station, you had one TV station uh, for the most of Ireland, around well, the north and and uh, and Dublin would and down the east coast would have had maybe BBC Grainy BBC, but um, so going out on a, on a weekend or even any night of the, of, of the week, uh, especially in the summer, we would have been playing six nights a week, every every week, sometimes seven. Uh, and um, so it was, a, it was a big deal. And also the fact that, you know, that uh, again, the background to, the, to, to that industry was that they would put up, there'd be what they call festivals, really sort of mark, you put a marquee in the middle of nowhere. You know, in the, in the middle of some townland, and uh, down your way, you could, you know, you obviously you had the the towns, the big towns, and the and 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 the, but some some place around there, you know, a townland that perhaps with forty or fifty people, they put put up a marquee, start a you know have a carnival or a festival in some, so all of the, the uh, chair planes and bumpers or dodgems, whatever you call them, all of these things would be brought in. And a band like us, we could draw um, maybe two and a half, three thousand people into that marquee on a Monday night, Tuesday, Wednesday, any night, any night of the week. So, so it was, you know, so not only were we playing the big towns, but we were also homogenous. We were drawing people out of the cities and the towns, uh, and uh, and into the country. And country people were meeting the the townspeople. So it was fabulous time. Very. very but there was, uh, there have been famous bands of that six hundred and fifty, some great bands, legendary bands, that because, for one reason or other, either they were playing, just purely pop music, they wouldn't have been, uh, a big draw. There'd be a big draw in the cities, but not a big draw in the country where people, you know, in the countryside where people were more into dancing. So uh, of all of those bands, there would have been a dozen maybe out of the 650 that were what, what you'd call 32 county bands, if you know where I'm going with this. So, you know, a band that could draw them in the cities, draw cr huge crowds in the countryside. And, and um, the Miami was one of those, one of those uh, bands. Um, they, they, they sort of, they took a risk in dropping the name show band but as I say, they wanted to. They, they had been. They had become morphed into this pop, really, really good pop band. Excellent players, and and uh, when you consider there are bands in America, you know, like uh, Chicago, and uh, you know, bands of what is a Scottish band called uh, Texas. Uh, so a name like that wouldn't have been wouldn't have been uh, sort of. Uh, out out of the ordinary at, at that stage a name is a name so uh, we were we were for me joining that band it was a massive step up you know you didn't have to do any work you turned up all your gear was set up for your everything just walked and you got a cup of tea or whatever it was or we always got there maybe about 20 minutes and the the uh, support band at that time the, they used to call them the relief band but it was a support band today you call them and they would be, they'd have the crowd whipped up and we walk on the stage, all the hard work is done, you know, and the crowd would go crazy. And it was like a dream come true, isn't it? For a young fella, for, for, young, for a young kid. As I say, I was 24 going on 14, you know, was, I was one of those uh, type, of, type of individuals, just like the rest of them are. Mm. Uh, on that note, do you... <clears throat> Do you remember the last gig you uh, you played with the band? What 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 um, ended up being the last gig? Well, yeah, we we normally like to have one night off a week. It wasn't always possible because the band was very popular. And the the night that you would you were most likely to have off was Tuesday, uh, because on a Monday night you could be playing what they call the TV Club, which was a big big venue in Dublin in Harcourt Street. And that would we'd have about two and a half thousand in there on a, on a Monday night. Um, 
we might play that once every all of the top pop bands that would be very very pop venue so you'd have all of the the, the, the young people in there so the, the night that you would probably as I say most likely to have off was a Tuesday but on that particular week we had played the Monday and Tuesday at the Galway races in a place called uh, Salt Hill in Galway which is um, over just outside Galway, it's a seaside resort, and there's a big, big venue there called Sea Point. And um, we, so we did the two nights there. So obviously, we weren't going to have Tuesday now. So, so they managed to. Um, they told us that we we would have the Thursday off, but we had had to play in in the north on on a Wednesday uh, that night in a place called the Castle Ballroom in Banbridge. And it was, it was a fairly um, sort of uh, short notice one. I think they only had a couple of weeks notice for that because there was a band called Kenny, uh, an English band called Kenny, a very popular uh, band that had some hit records out. And they pulled out of, of, of the North because of the troubles. As far as I know, that was there. So the promoter that that had that that particular was running that particular gig was frantically looking around for a band that would uh, would maybe be able to keep that crowd so we were we were the ones chosen for that but it didn't matter to us we were going to have Thursday off and it was the uh, a few days before had been our first wedding anniversary Anne and I uh, uh, were supposed to have our you know, go out for dinner or whatever it was. But so we put that off until we said we'll, we'll do it on Thursday uh, when on, on our night off. But unfortunately, uh, the, the night of the 30th um, in Banbridge, the Castle Ballroom, was the last gig because the following morning, the 31st of July, was um, uh, was was when when the uh, the incident occurred. Of course. Um, you, you, you probably... You probably were asked to recall it and and go through it uh, so many times, but would you mind would you mind taking me back to that night if if you could? Well, I, I won't go through uh, any of the horror. I just um you know that's already that's been covered and there's the Netflix documentary. You know we'll we'll uh, put that in context. But um the the you know the the interesting question always is you know why did it happen? Well, obviously. Uh, on our way back from the from the gig, one of our lads, our drummer Ray Miller, was he decided because we had the following day off, he was going to go back to his parents in Antrim rather than come back to Dublin with us. And um, I always remember Ray Ray always drove a a, a BMW, you know, for uh, he had this sort of uh, it's kind of a yellowish uh, BMW sports car. I can still see him heading off and. Uh, after the gig, and uh, so it was five of us on the way back. Our trumpet player Brian McCoy, um, he always drove our personnel van. We never travelled with the gear. The gear, the equipment was gone in another another van, and uh, so Brian kept the personnel van at home, and he was uh, um, so he was driving that. It was lovely, beautiful, beautiful evening, uh, a more beautiful morning by the time we got out. And normally we'd be gone before the gear, but the ladies at the and the catering ladies in the in the hall that night um asked us if we'd if we'd uh, if we'd like something to eat. And uh because we had the following night off, uh, Fran and I in particular, it uh we said, Yeah, we will, you know, we'd we uh talking to them and relaxing and knew, we knew there was no great hurry and uh, so we, we eventually got in the gear was gone uh, our roadie uh, road manager was called Brian McGuire and Brian had packed up quickly got the uh, got the gear in and as I say unusually he was about five minutes ahead of us so when you when you come out of that particular venue You've got to cross over the road and then come down the, the main road uh, you, sort of you cross over is like a, a road that 
goes over the main road and then you drive down and you had to come to a, a security barrier where the, the police would come and every so often and they would lift the barrier. It was to stop um, any uh, activity, terrorist activity. Uh, and then we got back onto, then turned around and got back onto the, on, onto the main uh, Belfast Dublin road, heading back home. At around, uh, it must have been around two o'clock, um, we were stopped on the way back by what we thought was a routine uh, army checkpoint. We, we knew there were UDR people there. We saw, we knew the uniforms. And um, the, instead of just the normal thing would be that, you know, especially UDR, which was, uh, UDR was the largest regiment in the British Army, but at the time it was, it would have been, uh, most of the people in the UDR, it stands for Ulster Defence Regiment, would have been locals. And it was, a lot of them were part-time as opposed to full-time British uh, British Army and the other regiments. And so those guys would have, we would have been well known to them because, I mean, you know, normally if they stop you, they'd ask you for an autograph or they'd ask you for, uh, and maybe if you had records or whatever it was, you know, and they'd be, they'd be happy to, to, to meet you. But this particular time we were surprised when, when they asked us to get out out of the, our personnel van. And um, so, well, we did. They said they wanted to do a check and Brian Brian McCoy was, as I say, our, tr our trumpet player, Brian, not to be confused with Brian McGuire, but Brian said, he was almost apologetic and he said, as we've got to get out, these gentlemen want to do a check on the van. And I had, um, it was new to me, but it was all a big adventure to me. I was a young fellow from South Tipperary, you know, uh, it was something that uh, like being in a movie, you know, your kid. And I was fascinated. I saw the guns, the people, the soldiers with the guns, and uh, and some of them were hunkered down, and they were actually very pleasant to us. We were we were told to stand at the side of the road with our hands on our heads. And again, I thought it was like something out of the movies. And uh, I was in the center. There was five of us and. Uh, Tony Tony Garrity, our guitar player, was on my left, and on Tony's left was Fran O'Toole, our singer. On my right then was um, was uh, Brian McGuire, Brian McCoy, trumpet player, and uh, on his right was Des McAlee, who was known as Des Lee in the band. And there was actually joking between them; they were they were they were joking with us. And it's hard to consider, you know, it's hard to conceive, uh, like you know in your head that these people knew what was going to happen and yet they were able to, to joke and, and um, while, while we were there um, I heard somebody at the behind us at the back of the van we had a, Vol a Volkswagen minibus and, so, and they had lifted the, the there's a little back sort of panel on the, on the Volkswagen minibus because the engine is in the back of those things, and uh, you could there was a little shelf at the back, so you could open that little sort of the the half back window, and there was a shelf there. And the only equipment we carried was Tony's guitar and my bass guitar. And um, so I heard a click, and I knew somebody was opening my my guitar case. Um. So I wasn't taking this thing seriously at all. Yeah, um, I took my hands down and I just turned around and walked back two or three steps. And I asked them uh, to be careful with my bass. It was an unusual bass. It was a, a, a Dan Armstrong plexiglass see-through, like one Kurt Cobain used a, 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 a guitar version of it. It was a, a see-through, like a glass guitar. It was made from plexiglass. And I loved it. Um, I didn't want anyone touching it because there was only, if only a few of those guitars. Mine have, obviously was a bass, but I had I had uh, I had one, and Phil Linnett had one from Tin Lizzy, and uh, Barry Devlin had one from Horse Lips and Wells. It was only a 
Um, brush Shields had one as well, a brush from Skid Row. And uh, so we're kind of proud of the stuff. And uh, so when I went back and, and asked him, Luke, I said, can I help you with that? Because I don't want, don't want you to, to uh, damage my guitar. And they weren't in any way sort of, you know, they weren't nervous or suspicious of my motives because they knew we were completely harmless people. And I pointed out, I had a little case beside it, a small, like a small old fashioned school case, a little brown case. And they asked me what was in that. And I said, uh, it was effects pedals, which is unusual again for a bass player because it's usually guitar players that use effects pedals. But I was using a wah wah pedal and uh, an octave divider, which split the uh, two frequencies, the high and the low frequency. I was into the gear at the time. And, um, uh, and they were more interested. They asked me, was there was there uh, any valuables in the case? And in hindsight, I suppose they were. They thought that maybe the, the money from the gig was in it, you know, but we didn't. We didn't handle any of that. Uh, that would have been gone with the roadie. And uh, so I said no, and they tore me around and punched me in the back and knocked me back into, into, into line. But instead of knocking me into the middle, they now knocked me between Ryan and Des. So I was almost within, I was actually within touching distance of the back of the van. Um, and then there was a, and this other man appeared on the scene and he was, without a shadow of a doubt, he was a, an English officer. Very posh. He, he showed up. He showed up in a car. I'm not sure. There was a car. A car came up behind us. Now I don't know whether he got out of that or whether he was already there. You know, I imagine because I didn't see him up until then. He pr he may well have been in that car. He doubt if he had travelled with the others. And uh, and he took charge without a shadow of a doubt. You know, he he was the one that started. He questioned. The soldiers who appeared to be in charge at that stage, and um, um, and as I say, I worked in the in, in London in the financial sector, so I was well used to uh, the various accents, and you know whether somebody was from the East End or of London, or whether they were a posh, or whether they were you know, um, uh, the, the 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 sort of this guy had a very posh accent, he did, uh, you know. I suppose you might call it educated uh, English accent. And um, basically he, he changed the orders. The order at the beginning was to take our names and addresses. And he changed that to, he told them that he wanted our names and dates of birth and that, time, which I believe now is, is the procedure. But I was fascinated this fellow. I thought, you know, he looked almost like a, a like a, like a comic strip hero, you know, one of the real, the real deal. He had the fatigues on and slightly different. He was, he had authority, he had a gun at his side and a uh, sidearm and um, all of the rest of the, the joking had stopped and they were all sort of, now they were standing up and they were sort of doing everything the, more professionally. And when he arrived, uh, Brian, Brian McCoy, who was, uh, uh, who was beside me, he, he, uh, he was now on my left since I had been knocked back into the thing. Brian said, nudge my elbow with his because we had our hands on our heads, you know, and he, he nudged my elbow and he said, don't worry, Steve, this is British Army, we'll be away soon. And he actually used the word British Army. So this was not UDR. And um, and, and the, uh, I wouldn't have known the difference um, other than the accent. And, but the difference was that he would have been more professional, professional soldier, and the UDR had a bad reputation for, you know, that they were, um, they could have given people, you know, a hard time or whatever. So Brian was convinced, and and Des on the other side said the same thing. He said, "Don't worry about your gear. The British Army are usually very careful with the gear." So here were two fellows from Northern Ireland, Catholic and Protestant, telling me that, you know, everything would be all right because this was British Army. Um, and I, I was satisfied at that, although the punch in the back was sort of made me a little bit sort of, uh, I, I felt this, this wasn't right. But I, I, had, I wasn't really suspicious that there was anything seriously going to happen. 
And um, what I didn't know was, none of us saw, was that there was a, two men placing a 10-pound bomb of commercial explosives underneath the driver's seat. Now, for years, we thought that the thing had been put in the back of the van. It wasn't. It was being put under the driver's seat. Um, and we wouldn't have known anything about that. And we would have, they would have said, thanks very much for your cooperation. And off you go. Um, and uh, nobody would have known about the, the roadblock. So we would have been down the road 10 minutes, uh, 10, 15 minutes. Again, for a long time, we were under the impression that there was maybe a, a longer uh, um, timing mechanism on it. But we now know from forensics that it was about 10 minutes. So we would have been in Newry. And at, at best, we would have been just over the board. But probably, in, I, I think, in Newry. So going through an area, this thing would have exploded. We would have been, uh, forensics would have shown that there was a bomb on board. And we would have gone down in history as terrorists, uh, carrying maybe uh, a bomb for the IRA or transporting something like that. Um, the frightening thing about that is, is uh, that you know, I watched a program recently uh, about Jerry Conlon the the uh, uh, one of the the men who were who was a sentence for, for the, the the Guildford bombings and um, and um, the scary thing is that obviously they they spent what 16, 17 years in in, in jail for something that they, they didn't do but um, there was a, a family called the Maguires Annie Maguire um, and, they, and they demonized these people because they were related to the Gondlands. And they said that this woman knew about it, because, knew about the, uh, about the, about the, these innocent men being terrorists. And they actually arrested her and her family, the Maguire, they called them the Maguire Seven. And one of them was a 16 year, year old kid. So when I look back on it, I think my wife was only, she was only 21 who never knew anything wouldn't have known the difference between the UDR and, 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 and UCC you know just wouldn't know any of this stuff that she would have they would have knocked on the door and perhaps arrested her for being for, for, for like they did to uh, and they would have arrested Fran's wife and, 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 and Brian's Brian's wife and probably if, even if you saw the documentary you saw Fran's father crying holding on to the coffin when he was being buried they would have arrested that man as well as you know and call him complicit so this is a horror and and there would be you, you would have like a life sentence of being known as as terrorists in history for, for, for all we know there, there might be a different netflix documentary there might be a netflix documentary about the band who was smuggling explosive for, for the ira and, and no one would know any differently absolutely but what happened and i you know i, I sometimes i reluctantly say this but I swear, the truth is what happened was if, you know it was, it was just uh, uh fortunately was that while they were these two, these two unfortunate men were planting the bomb underneath a, a man called uh, Wesley Somerville and another man called Harris Boyle, they were both uh, not only you know UDR, but they were also UVF, Ulster Volunteer Force, because there was they were interchangeable, and um, uh, the thing triggered. Um, and blew them to pieces. I mean, their injuries were horrific. Blew parts of them out into the field. It completely demolished the 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 van. And uh, as I say, we were close enough to touch it. And if you've seen any photographs of it, you see that it was, it was little or nothing left. And uh, it, it just it just uh, when it when it went off. Uh, it was just a surreal thing, and it lifted me up into the air. It blew Des, who Des was beside me, and it blew him into the 
into the ditch and there was a field about three meters below the, the, the road that we were facing with our hands on our heads. And um, he, he was blown down into, into, the, uh, in, into the, the field below and into the ditch where he managed to, to, to lie low and uh, I was I was blown up into the air, and it was like I often describe it as you know the whole world turned red, and I was the uh, uh, everything sort of went into slow motion, and I could I felt I could think logically like that I had all the time in the world to to uh, work this stuff out in my head. I, I could hear the gunfire instantly as uh, while I was still in the air. And uh, and then I started to fall down through the the ditch and the bushes and um and my sense of it was, it was a heightened sensitivity now whether that's adrenaline I don't know but as I went down even through my clothes I could I could feel every single leaf and bramble and twig as I fell down through the bushes down into the field. It was like I could I had time to count every one of them, and uh, I, 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 in my head, I thought we were that these soldiers had been attacked, and we were caught in the crossfire. That was that was the only thing that made sense to me, and I hit the ground really hard. And what I didn't realize was, um, I think that I had been hit in midair. Uh, by what they call a dum dum bullet, and uh, a dum dum bullet is specially designed so that on impact it, it, it explodes. It hit me in the right hip, exploded inside me. Part of it went through my left lung and out under my le uh, left arm, so it went right across my body. Did exploded into sixteen pieces. Um, uh, so I had a lot of serious damage. I said, and. When I hit the I, slow motion went to very fast and I hit the ground very hard, and two other two other bodies fell on top of me and that was I think can't be sure but I think it was um, Fran and Tony and uh, they got up and Brian again I can't be certain but I think it was Brian put his hands under me under my arms and tried to drag me, but I was a dead weight. And he dragged me as far as he could into the field. And, um, but I was, uh, as I say, I was a dead weight. I had been shot. I couldn't, I couldn't walk. Um, and he was murdered. Uh, the soldiers jumped down into the field and started shooting. They jumped down instantly. And they shot Brian in the back and the head and the back of the head. And he shot him in the arms and, so he he was murdered within a few feet of me, um, and then they chased. They didn't have far to go. They 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 chased after Fran and Tony, and they were just a few a couple of yards away from us, and they murdered murdered them. Um, and uh, I I heard them I heard them dying, uh, begging for their lives, and uh, there's I mean you often see, uh, you know reports that. Fran was shot in the face 22 times. He wasn't. He was shot 22 times. And seven of those were in the face. But um, because that type of damage uh, was, was enough, once would have been enough to do awful damage. But seven times it's terrible. And, um, and the screaming and the shouting. The one thing that, one thing that sort of I always remember was the obscenities. The cursing, the swearing, the shouting, the screaming. Just the cursing of the soldiers. It was rage, absolute rage. And uh, they, when everything went quiet, uh, there was just some single shots happening. And it was this soldier walking around, firing into the dead bodies to make sure they were, and then got over to where Brian was beside me and he started kicking him violently to see to make sure there was no sign of life and firing and he came over to me and uh, I just kept my face pressed down into the ground and pretended to be dead I just didn't make a sound and um, 
I was waiting for him to shoot. Uh, I, at one stage, I, I, I considered getting up and begging for my life, but um, I'm glad I didn't. I just stayed quiet. And just as he was standing over me, somebody on the road shouted, come on, those bastards are dead. I got them with dum-dums. And he just walked away and he didn't fire into me. Uh, after that, after a while then, I, um, when they appeared to be gone, um, I heard a voice calling me. It was Des. He was over by the ditch. And uh, he called Fran and he called Brian and Tony. There was no answer. And then he called me. And I answered. I just said, he said, he said, are you okay? I said, like, you know, it's almost comical when you think about it. You know, Irish people, they go into a restaurant, they get a meal that they don't like. And then somebody says, you know, how was that? And they say, that's grand, you know. And I actually said that when he said, are you okay? I said, I'm grand. It was like, you know, but, and then he, he, he left and he got up onto the road and he eventually got somebody to, there was a truck was stopped and truck wouldn't take him, thought he was perhaps part of something. And then a car, there was a car, a young couple in the car and they brought him in and he reported it. And I was in the field about, for about an hour crawling around and between the, 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 the bodies and the body parts and all that. And I was, um, they wouldn't come into the field. The, the security forces wouldn't come into the field because they thought the bodies might be booby trapped. And well, that's what they said. And then they sent a helicopter in and eventually they came in and, and they, they, uh, they took me out. I suppose I hope that's not too, too horrific, but it's, um, that's what happened. Oh, of course, of course. Um, do, do you remember, um, uh, it's been reported that there were 10, uh, 10 gunmen and then the, the fellow with the, the posh accent came along with making 11. Um, did, did, did it seem to you, did, did that number seem about right to you? Did it seem like there was about 10? Well, I didn't see everybody who was there. I saw, I safely say I saw five, um, but we we're told that there was about 10. But uh, the planning that went into this, you know, took uh, uh, certainly wasn't planned by the people that that pulled the triggers that night. It wasn't, it was planned. It was a very, very, um, and this, this would be quite relevant now to somebody like yourself living abroad. Um, you know, for a long time, we thought that, you know, this, the plan was to just simply to, to uh, um, throw a cat among the pigeons and to say that you can't trust anybody. And uh, so we better seal the border, you know. So if you can't trust anybody, we're going to have to do stop and search for everybody because the Irish politicians, especially around the border counties, you know, or Cavan and Monaghan and maybe Donegal, that they didn't want all of this stop and search because their constituents, you know, living on the border would have would have been driving into the north. It should be like a quarter of a mile, you know, or a few yards going to the and they get maybe cheaper cigarettes or cheaper petrol. So, you know, it might the nearest town or shop might be just over the border. So to have a stop and search would have disrupted their lives. So their their TDs, their poli local politicians, or even national politicians would have said, you know, we really don't want that kind of disruptive thing happening. But the British were very keen to uh, to curtail the movements of the IRA because the IRA would commit an atrocity um, in the north, and then they would cross the border to relative safety. And when I say relative safety, I mean, there wouldn't have been that many checks because, uh, uh, because in the north, you could, you could be on the road two minutes and you'd have some, you know, it could be a Scottish regiment, British regiment, could be UDR, whatever, would, you know, you, you could be liable to be stopped. That really wasn't the case in the south. So in order to, uh, to, to have stringent, strict security, um, this would have worked if they had fr fr framed us because they would have said, who can you trust? And I thought that was about the, the size of it. But um, I spent Christmas looking at, I, I read 14,000 files from our case over Christmas. And yeah, Christmas, uh, excuse me, or? Yeah, just just gone, yeah. Uh, I, eventually, I eventually got the, 
the, the, the case files, because as you know, we took a case against the British government. And uh, um, I'm convinced now that it was a much more ambitious, uh, um, much more ambitious plan that somebody like yourself or anybody living abroad, um, because as you know, there would have been a lot of uh, um, sympathy for the Republican cause in, in America and in, in, in other countries. And um, so not only would they have stopped people crossing the border, but they would have stopped people crossing any border, whether it was, so being an Irish person, um, they would have sent out uh, a message to all of their embassies and to all of the other countries and other governments and said, sorry, but we really have a legitimate reason for stopping every Irish person and checking their passports and finding out. So it, it would have been incredibly disruptive to every Irish person living abroad on the planet, never mind crossing any border. So at airports, you would have had uh, border crossings throughout Europe as well. I mean, one country into another. And it would have been a very, very convincing argument, you know, to say, look, their most popular pop group were, were at this. So we can't take any risks. So today you would be like a Palestinian. You come to the airport, you're going to be singled out and you're going to be hauled aside and, and asked where you're from. They take every single detail. So it was, and you saw how easy that was to do and uh, the way they were able to lock people down during COVID. Um, so it's not beyond the, you know, the, the, the wit of man to say that, that this would have worked and worked very well. We've, we've seen it working when, um, you know, when, when foot and mouth disease happened and there was, you know, border, uh, border, border checks. And you and I would, you know, if, if nobody knew about that checkpoint, and if, you know, looking from a, an objective point of view, um, you'd say, well, you know, the good reason for stopping, if, you, if these fellows were at it, you know, well, you know, uh, there's, there's a reason. Because when you consider the Birmingham Six, you consider the, uh, the, the, the Guildford Four, you consider the Maguire family, the newspapers, not just in Britain, but the newspapers in Ireland and everywhere else were saying, you know, you know, let them rot in jail. So the propaganda kicks in and all of these things are, uh, it, you believe what, what the likes of Murdoch and people like that put on their newspapers. Uh, um, so and this is why I say fortunately, and thank God, you know, that two of us lived uh, to, to tell the truth about this. Uh, and we, we, we took a case um, against against the British government because there was never any you know, solid. You know, you, when you go to court, um, you have to be you have a very solid uh, evidence. And there was a British set up uh, this thing called the H Historical Inquiries Team, the HET, and that was made up of of uh, British detectives and the. Uh, looking into, into the troubles between a particular period. And we fell into that period. And uh, they, uh, the report was strong enough to say that there was collusion in our case between, between the security forces and the Ulster Volunteer Force, which was a terrorist organization, although at the time it wasn't prescribed. And um, so it gave us enough to take the, the case. And we thought that this case, according to our solicitor, in Belfast, this case should have taken eighteen months to uh, to two years, but they dragged their feet on it to the extent that it took nine years uh, to to get them into court. And you know they they have this obscene bill now called the 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 legacy bill that's going through, and they think it'll be passed this week. L legacy and reconciliation, yeah. Yeah, well, the word reconciliation is an, an abomination when it, if, if, if it's in any way connected to this uh, legacy bill, which is simply a cover up. But um, and they, they say that they want to speed up the process of people getting uh, getting truth. It's a complete lie. 
It's a lie because the reason that 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 these court cases haven't progressed is because, uh, as is evident in our case, um, they refuse to give, uh, you have to drag every single thing from them. You have to go through process of getting, in any case, get discovery and then specific discovery uh, uh, evidence. And even the judge um, uh, that was uh, uh, that, that was uh, uh, dealing with our case during the process of trying to get them into court had to reprimand them and say, you know, this is outrageous that you're not We've ordered you 18 months ago to hand over these documents. And this, they pay no attention to them. They have no respect for our judiciary. Um, but we eventually got them into court. And um, they, they offered, uh, um, when they knew they, there was no way out, they, they offered a settlement and I refused. And they, uh, they said that um, it had to be Although there were four separate cases, that was Fran's wife, Brian's wife, Des, and myself, four separate cases. But they said, strangely, it has to, we have to settle all four cases or, we're, or else we're settling none. And um, because my initial, uh, when I was told that, uh, my initial response was, well, let the others settle it because if they want closure, they're not young anymore. And not that I am young myself, I'm 72 now, but when, you know, I said, I want to fight my case. And they were offering this, this settlement and um, uh, payment. And, um, but I turned it down first. And then even up to about a week, two weeks before it went into court, I still turned it down. I wanted the case heard, but there, uh, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Brendan Lewis, was, was on the paper saying that they're going to get this legacy bill, which closes down all cases, closes down all, 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 even even civil cases, uh, and and uh, inquests. And he was threatening to get that over the line by Christmas, and we were we were due to our court case. Our court date was December the thirteenth, twenty one, and so. There was a danger that you know, if had there been a um, a delay for whatever reason, it could have been you know somebody ring in and say, "Well, we've COVID, we have to put it off for six months, whatever." But they were saying that you know, if this happens, your case won't be heard at all. So there'd be no satisfaction whatsoever in what you fought for for the last. So effectively, what they did was they blackmailed me and they said, uh, "You know, you'll be the cause of of the others." Not, not not getting any closure. So I reluctantly decided, you know, it's, it's better than nothing. And um, and I agreed to settle. Uh, but when I came out, all, all the TV cameras and all of those, are the usual thing, are all, all there. And I, I let my feelings be known. I said they were afraid to fight us in court and they forced, forced me to take this. I had no choice. Uh, but either way, you know, they they uh, they settled and they gave us this this uh, payment, and um, that in itself is an admission of guilt, you know. But but officially, they said that they were settling without uh, an admission of liability. If 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 I could take it back a small bit um, to to like. To, to like instantly after after the night in question I, I suppose it would have been uh, on the topic of collusion I suppose it would have been obvious straight away that there was some element of collusion given it was um a British army regiment and and so on but but was that like like was that in your mind uh like like mm -hmm. in the weeks and months after did 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 you feel like you you'd been a victim of collusion or, or or was it just the case you you felt maybe a victim of the of the the UVF uh I didn't um I didn't know the meaning of the word collusion. I think I was completely and totally, uh, you know, ignorant of all of these terms. I, I, I knew nothing about it. I, for years and years afterwards, you know, I didn't see the relevance of, of, of a British Army officer in charge of, of, of that operation. I thought that a British Army officer might come along and just because he'd be more senior, uh, be overseeing an operation by the UDR. 
So I didn't I didn't understand that. And when I brought it up in the preliminary trials, um, um, I think it was the year after or whatever, when the first two people, Crozier and McDowell, were in 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 uh, uh, in, in court for 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 the murders. Um, I remember saying to the to the, uh, the 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 barrister who's apparently supposed to be on our side, the uh, the prosecution. I said, "Will I mention the English officer?" And they said, "Don't. It's it's it's, it's not important." Um, and I didn't uh, I didn't even question that. But later on, when you begin to look at the bigger picture, but um, to be honest with you. John, you know, I, I didn't want to believe in collusion. I didn't want to believe that the security forces would do that. I wanted to believe in the in the rule of law. And this is why I say, you know, that when you go back to when I was young and you go back to that we were happy in our ignorance. And I think, you know, it's something that uh, it's a great regret, but but. That's the way we were brought up, you know. We 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 turned our backs on the on 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 our nationalist uh, brothers and sisters in the north. Now, I don't want to relive the um, civil war again because I mean that's for academics. But the civil war happened and the partition happened, um, and there wasn't a whole lot anybody could do about it uh, um, at the time. There's uh, you know there's a threat of 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 a terrible war by by Britain. So. Either way, whatever way you know you come down on that, but there were times that we just left them. You know, we walked away, turned our backs on, and even though you had uh, this famous, you know, this is a Protestant state for Protestant people. Um, surely we should have, you know, we should have uh, uh, said, "Hold on a second, we need to to ensure that these people are treated properly." You know, but so today uh, I gave the. I give the um the the Arthur Griffith lecture in Calvin County Museum there uh, uh, some a few months ago, and it's one of the things that I brought up that you know we talk about reconciliation, and I'm part of a group called Truth and Reconciliation Platform. You can go on to uh, tarp tarp dot ie and and you'll see that you know we work with people victims from uh, all from all the communities and and uh, I, I hope we're even handed and but um you know when it's it's one of the things that when I at, at the Arthur Griffith lecture it's that has become pretty obvious to me now is that we use the word reconciliation out of context because as you can see we call the group truth and reconciliation platform but my experience since 2016 working with uh, TARP is that reconciliation, um, and this is open uh, to debate, but to reconcile with somebody is to is to you know to to come back together. I mean that's how I see the meaning of the word. You know to reconcile is to 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 bring people together again. Well, there was never a time when. The uh, um, nationalists and unionists were were together. They were never singing from the same hymn sheet. They were never uh, so. The word reconciliation, I don't think, is appropriate. I think the word, the appropriate word, would be would be would be to uh, resolution, really, to resolve the problems you know that exist between the two communities and the great people in both communities and great the communities suffered terribly. You know, nobody has a monopoly on the suffering or the loss. But but having said that, you know, I, I think we should we should try to work towards a, a resolution of the problems that have existed. But reconciliation, as I said at the time, is not redundant, redundant because reconciliation the, the reconciliation, the unspoken reconciliation, really that we have to work at is the reconciliation between the northern and southern nationalists, because there's a lot of hurt there. There's a lot of suspicion there. There's a lot of um, things that need to be talked about that's uh, not talked about. Um, and, uh, and, and, and because if we're heading for a united Ireland, which I hope we are, 
I, I think it's good for I think it's good for everybody um, because uh, Northern Ireland, as it stands, is a failed state. I mean, and it's just, it's irretrievable for Britain. You know, there's no way that it's ever going to go back to being uh, what it was before. Um, I believe any United Ireland will come about through a consensus. It, it has to. And, but it'll be brought about by people, young people, regardless of, of, of religion or politics, young people trying to put a roof over their head or get a mortgage or to feed their kids or uh, educate their kids and look after their families. And whoever offers the best prospects for these people are the ones that it, it, it will, whether the union is maintained or whether there's a United Ireland, it'll be decided by young people like that who are looking to the future. Um, but in the event of 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 a closer political relationship between the uh, the north and as you can see, perhaps uh, Sinn Fein are are uh, uh, the most popular party at the moment. But unless the problems and the suspicions and the hurt is is addressed and talked about, and discussed, and people see. Uh, people understand uh, the past. It's not just enough to know it. You must understand the past. Um, unless we do that, then the coming together of any kind of coalition uh, would be would be dangerous and toxic. So we need we need that type of discussion. That's what I believe, but I, i'm 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 not a political animal, but I just I'm pragmatic. I think that that's um. That's something that's that that needs to be looked at. Um, it's just like understanding why people did things, and people are often surprised when I say, "I understand why why one person kills another person. I understand why I was shot. I was I understand why there was anger there. I understand. I'm not agreeing with it. I mean, who would want to be out of your mind to say you know you know uh, that I I agree with somebody shooting me or killing the lads, but I do understand why these things happen. It's like a virus. Unless you understand the virus, you can't you, you can't get rid of it. So the the toxicity that exists in in in, in, in society that that continues to 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 poison society it needs to be taken out. And and as I say, like a like a virus, unless you understand it and you try to understand it, there's dialogue. Then. Uh, you, you, you you don't you can't even begin to eradicate it. Right. I was going to say there's a big difference between uh, between understanding something and excusing it. You know, I mean, or yeah. and justifying. I mean, you can, like, you you can read history and you can understand why the German people um went on went on the the route they went in the 30s and 40s, but but not justify it. Yeah. The, yeah the, absolutely. A big yeah. difference. I I I, I I wanted to ask you there, like. In, again, in like the months, weeks, and decades, um, following the attack, um, what was there a part of you that had a desire to to know who it was, as in who who the members who were there on the night are and the people who planned it, um, what, what, was it something that that made a difference to you at all? The just ju just knowing who it was, you know. Well, um, yeah, I mean, you know, the for years afterwards, I. One of the things that stopped me thinking like that was the fact that I wanted to put it out of my mind. I thought, you know, that uh, if I did that, if I just did what a lot of people very arrogantly say today, you know, put the past behind you, look to the future and move on, which is the most ridiculous thing you ever heard. But at the time, I was inclined to think, you know, that this is possible. If so many people are telling you, you know, put it behind you, move on, it's but it's as mad to say that to somebody as as it is to say to somebody with terminal cancer, you know, put it behind you and move on. You know, you can't do that. And and uh, the trauma that's been experienced by people on both sides, by people, and and we deal with that, uh, uh, engage with with uh, people who have been through terrible, terrible trauma. You know, co-founder of our group is Eugene Reevy whose three brothers, innocent young men, were murdered in White Cross on the on on the the fourth of 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 January nineteen seventy six. Um, watching television, these people just came in and slaughtered them. The following night, um, I think it was the fifth January. The following night, on the sixth January, their neighbours were murdered uh, at at Kingsmill when 
they were slaughtered coming home, uh, 11 people, um, 10 of them Protestants and one Catholic, and just slaughtered just down the road from where the Reedy's thing happened. And so Joe Campbell, whose father was a, 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 one of the sort of rare enough Catholic policemen trying to do a good job, are you seeing, man? Uh, went to join the guards and then there was an embargo on the guards who weren't recruiting so himself and his brother ever before the troubles when took off um just said well, what the hell we'll join the he go up north and joined the they were living in monaghan i think it was and he went joined the RUC. didn't think and then the troubles broke out and he reported um a good he was a good policeman in in very popular uh with everybody when he was stationed in cross middle end and they were moving up to cushion doll there was a, 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 a thousand signatories uh, um, collected to keep him in 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 Cross Midland. He was so popular, such a good man. And when he moved up to Cushendall, he discovered uh, uh, an illegal importation of arms by uh, loyalist paramilitaries, and he reported it to his uh, superiors. And instead of acting on that, uh, they. Um, they sent out their their people and they murdered him for that. So you know, uh, Joe's father was uh, just one of these really good people, and 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 he was shot in the back of the head, murdered. So we deal with and, and engage with people all the time. Joe's a very very important member of uh, uh, and driving force behind TARP as well. But you know, the list is endless. Yeah, the list of awful atrocities. People, you know, like McGurk's Bar, who they succeeded in framing those people for years, and now the truth is coming out. People like Kathleen Gillespie, the the IRA held held, held her hostage, and and uh, because her husband had taken a job as a cook to feed his family, he took a job as a cook in uh, in in the uh, in, in an army barracks, nothing to do with any politics, and they chained him into a car and made him told him that they'd kill his family if he didn't drive down to a, an army checkpoint. And when he got there, he opened the window and shouted, run, I'm loaded. And, you know, Kathleen, Kathleen Gillespie, I know her very well, good, decent person, Catholic family as well. So, you know, this makes it all more the more, you know, ironic that the IRA should do this. But they... I remember talking to Kathleen one day and she said, you know, she said, I'm not the only one ever to lose a husband in the in the troubles. She said, my problem is that we couldn't find any part of him to bury when the bomb went off in his car. But what they buried was a small piece of skin hanging off a bush attached to a zip. So, the, you know, it's all very well to, for people to look back at the troubles and say, you know, uh, it was a, you know, it was a, a glorious war, whatever side you you, you happen to have an uh, uh, an empathy with, it wasn't. There was nothing glorious about it. Even when I speak to uh, the paramilitary organisation representatives uh, that that murdered our lads and shot me, even they will say it. Nothing glorious about it. It was terrible, and yet you've got these youngsters who are keen to get stuck into this fighting again. God help them. Uh, as I say, it's it's important that the voices of the people that we work with in TARP, the voices of the victims, the voices of the perpetrators, the voices of all of the voices, even those from the grave, that they're heard. Because unless they are, we make the same mistake again and we use violence as a political expedient or as some way to change society when John Hume told us that we now know that it's a far better way to do it. It's through politics. It's through making uh, uh, making uh, whatever aspiration you have, make it more attractive than the aspiration the other person has so that you can convince people that you know what, and United Ireland is the, it's the right thing to do or union is the right thing to do. But from my own, uh, um, in my own opinion, I think that uh, a United Ireland would be far better for everybody. Um, of the um, of of the ten that were there, I I, I think it's I, I think it's accepted that okay, obviously the the two who were killed by their own bomb, 
um, uh, John, uh, Wesley Somerville and Harris Boyle. They're obviously confirmed. There was someone named Thomas Crozier. Um, there was also uh, John Somerville. Um, mm -hmm. Have uh, have the other members have their identities come to light, and, and especially yeah. the that of the of the 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 posh the posh accent guy. Yeah, well, uh, of the names you mentioned, there was also uh, Shane Roderick McDowell, so he was he was convicted as well. Um, I've never been able to identify the soldier. Now, uh, the the other survivor maintains that it was uh, Nyrek, uh, but even in even in the court, I wasn't able to identify in the the people in the dock. I just don't have a great uh, uh, um, a great uh, memory for 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 faces now i'm told that is probably a result of the trauma because what i saw in the uh, in the field was horrific because as you as i said i was there for an hour and it was a, a moonlit night so what i saw is not wasn't great um having said that uh um yeah nyrick nyrick captain robert nyrick is uh his he was accused by his his own uh uh, people serving in the in the um, in the security forces uh, with him um, have made a statement saying that he's the one that planned and executed uh, the Miami incident. But uh, since we've we've also been told, you know that that uh, that because the description that I gave uh, of the officer that I saw, I thought he had more fair hair than the pictures I saw of Nairi. But so I've never been able to say, but. There have uh, been, you know, reports to us that that uh, there was more than one British officer there. That there was actually two plus a driver uh, and somebody else. But um, that's it's it's unsubstantiated. So I don't know. Um, I, I can't I can't say for sure. Um, but I also I I also believe that there was uh, apart from the the people who were that we know died at the scene. Um, I think there was at least another another one person, but don't have evidence of that yet. Uh, that was that was taken away before there's any report done. I see, I see. Um, it, it's also been reported that that there's a very. I I, I just spoke to um, my my last interview was with a lady named um, Anne Cadwaller. Um, oh, I wrote, know her. Yeah, I know Anne. Ca I know Anne Cadwaller. Too, Anne. Yeah, very, very nice lady. Um, wrote a, probably the leading book or, or one of the leading books about about British collusion with um with loyalist paramilitaries. Um, and we we spoke mainly about the Glennon gang. Uh, one one of the members, one one of the more infamous uh, loyalist killers was a fellow named Robin Jackson. And it's been rumored and alleged that he was there on the night. Have Have you heard anything, even unofficially, uh, like oh, no, that? He 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 was there. He was uh, he had just taken over. That particular group uh, um, of UVF people, uh, um, the the person who was who was the leader of that group shortly before him, was murdered by themselves, was a man called Billy Hanna, and Billy Hanna was involved in the Dublin and Monaghan bombings, and he was also in. Um, uh, when one of the one of the uh, very interesting things about about our documentary when we made it with with Netflix. Was that there's a as a section that people, you know, sometimes don't see the relevance of. But one of the the, the former head of of a special branch, is a man called Raymond White, and he is in the documentary, and he actually says in the documentary, he says, "I believe that the same people who were responsible for Dublin and Monaghan were responsible for the Miami show band killings." Now, I have no doubt about that whatsoever because. I believe Jackson was involved, and Jackson was also involved. Jackson was involved in the killing of Joe Campbell, the man that I mentioned, Sergeant Joe Campbell. He was also involved in the killing of William Strathairn, a decent man who opened a, his chemist, the chemist shop, because he was told that there was a sick child, and Jackson was there, and Jackson shot him, shot him dead. And when it went to court, and Jackson wasn't in court when they were uh, when when McCaughey and uh, and John Weir were on trial policeman and when when the question was asked in court why Jackson wasn't there the, the answer given to the judge was for operational reasons and this was given by a senior police officer so how do you say that somebody who was you know 
expected to do this, which he did kill William Strathairn. How can the judge accept that? He's not here for operational reasons. Just let it go like that. So massive collusion. Robin Jackson, um, undoubtedly, is the is the the linchpin for all of this. If you if you if you nail Jackson, and there's plenty of evidence there, but uh, of course the uh, the British wouldn't um, they 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 wouldn't uh, uh, cooperate with the with the, the Baron Tribunal, they wouldn't call, as I'm sure Anne Cadwallader would have told you all that, um, but uh, just they don't cooperate. Uh, uh, so uh, unfortunately, you know, it's difficult to get all of the, to get all of the files and the evidence. And that's why they're shutting down these cases. That's why they're, 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 this legacy bill is being pushed through. It's not, definitely not to protect their soldiers the British soldiers, because they've used those for 600 years as ca cannon fodder, to protect the people who gave the uh, the orders and made these brilliant plans. Because, you know, and when you look at it, had they pulled off the Miami one, had they successfully framed us, it would have been a brilliant result for them. It begs the question, how many others did they manage to, to frame as well? The, the, ones, the ones that we'll never know about. Um, yeah. you you mentioned there, um, you mentioned there about going through um case files um during during Chris, Christmas just passed. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what like like when you look through these, I, I I assume that this is information that that isn't that isn't like like publicly available. And when 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 you when you look through these, um, how do I say it? Like like how do you uh how do you come to the conclusion that that the people higher up um knew about it? Like 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 what? What is in the files that that, that would indicate? Well, first of all, they managed to. Uh, the only re the only way I could get the files was that I uh, I said that you know that I wouldn't use them and that I wouldn't know. That may you know we may be able to uh, to appeal that. Um, so I can't tell you what's in the files. Uh, I can't uh, I can't say that. But um, without a shadow of a doubt, the people who carried out the Miami incident carried out the Dublin and Monaghan. Bombings and and a number of others. The, the trigger men, the people, the people who pulled the trigger and and were there, they were not capable of of these of operations of uh, this uh, complexity, on without a shadow of a doubt. And it is worth reading Anne Cadwallader's book. It's called Lethal Allies. Um, uh, my book, uh, the one that led to the Netflix documentary. Is much more personal because it, you know, I'm not expert on, on the, uh, on the other, on, on on other cases. But what I am at this stage is, uh, I am expert on my own case, you know, uh, and uh, only because I've, you know, I've I've done the research, but also because of the research that was done by people like Justice for the Forgotten uh, and and uh, Patrick Centre and uh, other people. That um, you know, there are some very good writers, uh, and uh, and people who've who've you know who've who've researched this. I was I remember I was giving a, a a talk in Phoenix in Arizona one time. Uh, it was because of the Netflix documentary, which rose our case into you know international prominence, and it's probably the most viewed uh, film ever made of the troubles. When you consider that you know that. Uh, that it was, it it was Emmy nominated on on Netflix, and it was uh, along with that then it was trended twice or three times, you know, uh, all over the world. So I remember giving the talk in Phoenix, and there was this man. Just clearly, he he wasn't uh, he wasn't Irish, and in just looking at me, you knew he was an Irish. You know, um, and uh, um, this man knew more about me than I did. You know, he stood up to ask a question. Uh, and I get this you now all the time that there are people, you know, who are, and they're, they do objective studies, people who have no axe to grind, you know, they're just interested in their academics from all around the world. And um, they, they get in touch. It's the reason that I'm, I'm here talking to you today is because what we need is information, education more than anything else. You know, it's not about me anymore. It's not about, you know, uh, and, but, information and education so that people 
you know, we're all, we are a counter radicalization group who will tell you, you know, well, you know, things have to change, uh, but violence is not, is not how to do it. And that may not go down very well with some people who believe that there was some kind of a glorious war there, but it just isn't because anybody who, you know, who, uh, who thinks that, that they're, you know, that by supporting a violence or a, an armed struggle, if anybody thinks that they're completely, you know, they're living in, in, in another world because violence, all it does is make people on either side uh, of the political divide uh, um, uh, go back into their own enclaves and entrench. So it would put back, if somebody thinks that by by supporting violence is going to get you in a United Ireland, well, they're wrong because it would put back the unification of Ireland by 50 years if the trouble started again. Just, you know, so the only way you can do that is by is, is to bring people together, resolve their problems, uh, and and then put the uh, the argument forward. This is why I think we should have a United Ireland, or somebody will say, this is why I think we should maintain the union with Britain. But it's it's discussion and dialogue. That's what's that's what's needed, and that's the only thing that will resolve this. Violence won't resolve. It's uh, uh, I, I think that's why. You know, well, it certainly is the reason that I'm talking to you today, so is that somebody will listen uh, and and maybe make their own minds up. I see. Um, actually, on that note, I was going to ask you this question anyway, but but it kind of, it kind of fits with what you're saying. Um, one of my one of my guests a couple of weeks ago um, is a, a, a lady named Joe Berry. Uh, for, for anyone who doesn't know, um, her father was killed in the, the attempt to kill Margaret Thatcher in 1984 with a bomb. Um, her, her father was a, a fairly, fairly high up politician, Anthony Berry. Um, and what she's known for um, at the moment is the fact that she's formed a relationship and, and eventually a friendship with um, a man named Patrick McGee, who was the the person, what one of the people who planted the bomb, but but the main one, they they do speaking tours and so on. Um, th- this yeah. is purely hypothetical. I'm, I'm I'm not trying to like set it up or anything, but if um if like one of the men from that night came forward and 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 said, listen, I I want to um I want to come clean and and talk and 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 talk about this, and I I regret what I'm doing and so on. W- would you would you be in any way open to to like like doing? Doing um uh, a Joe Berry um on it and and meeting like a person, um meeting speaking with uh, attempting to understand um someone who would someone who who intended to kill you or, or almost. Well, I, I've done that. Uh, two things. I know Joe Berry very well. She's a, she's an incredibly brave lady, and um, I I, I remember I, I met uh, Joe and. And um, Pat, in in I was I was speaking in Amsterdam, and 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 I met them both, and I listened to them. Um, she's a remarkable lady. Um, no, I mean there 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 are, you know, but it's 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 actually um, it's an interesting, it's a, it's an interesting, uh, um, it's interesting to see them see them talking together. Uh, now there's no personal relationship there, you know there. Uh, between them there there but there is Joe has made a, a a real attempt to you know to understand what has happened but um Patrick McGee has said in the past you know the you know I'm sorry your father was killed but I'm not sorry I killed him you know so this is this is the difficulty that 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 arises because there's a you know it's ideology versus you know uh, a personal thing that you know there is a conflict there. And these are the things that need to be talked out and they need to be, I have met, uh, well, you saw on the Netflix documentary, I sat down with uh, representatives of the of the UVF. Um, and what you didn't see in the documentary when you watched that is that, you know, there were other people there, not on camera, that were making sure that this was, you know, this was going to go uh, a certain way. But we're very, very lucky in, in so far as that, the the uh, the the uh, director and the producer of the documentary obviously were there, and they weren't going to allow the the you know the the conversation, they weren't going to allow the 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 this opportunity that that we had decided to take together, 
DVF and myself, um, that we weren't going to allow it to be to be hijacked and to you know to be used in some way as a sort of a proper propaganda mechanism. Uh, the the integrity of of the of the director Stuart Sender, Sender and and uh, and uh, Alexander Orton Ali Orton, you know, that ensured that this wasn't going to be sensational, wasn't going to be anything like that. But the lead up to that was very 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 cautious because the UVF didn't uh, well clearly they. They, they don't get good press. Uh, that's you know that's, that's a bit of an understatement. So so they're suspicious of the of the of the media, and of course there was an attempt you know to put their own slant on it. But if you watch the documentary, I, I closed down that argument straight away um, when 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 uh, when I said to Winston, you know, look, uh, I wouldn't agree with you there, but you know, let's let's see what if we can if we can talk about something else if we can you know if we can if we can see what what we can do in the future. I think it was an opportunity missed by uh, by um, the Irish government, and uh, certainly by the Irish government and the British government, because we had, you know, it successfully, you know, started a conversation, and it was a very public conversation, that that we would see what we could do to uh, to maybe maybe uh, you know, you're never going to you know, give closure to, to but to, maybe to improve things and to um, improve, as I keep going back to, an understanding between people. Uh, and that may have led on to something else, maybe between Republicans and, and, and their victims, whatever. But we started a process there, but it wasn't followed through. Uh, and that, I think, is, was, was a mis, mix, missed opportunity. But I do believe um, uh, that... that uh, uh, it's a difficult process to start, uh, but what you were saying, you know, did did I ever sit down with them? I did. If you again, if you look at, at the book, um, there's a section in the book called the Craftsman, which was was the second in command of the UVF, and it took a quite a bit of maneuvering to have a meeting with them. I had a meeting with them in a in the bowels of a of a Presbyterian church in Belfast, you know, a secret meeting and. Was supposed to last for twenty minutes, half an hour, where he would give a, an opinion and uh, all of this type of thing, and it actually lasted for five hours. So, if you read the book, the uh, the Miami Showman Massacre: A Survivor Search for the Truth, that I wrote with my friend Neil Featherston Hall, um, uh, you, you can you can see that on uh, my website is stephentravers.org. dot uh, But so, sure, I I think that it's 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 important and i have done it and i think that it's very worthwhile to talk to these people um now i've never been able to hate them so maybe that helps uh, there was a while there when i thought that uh, maybe there was something missing you know that that i i just didn't have this hatred i even from the moment i woke up in hospital um i didn't even dislike them i just liked what they did and i hated what they did uh, but I never hated the individual. So it's, I was able to uh, to engage with them, and I still am able to engage with them. And uh, channels aren't, aren't, aren't cut off. So what, as I say, it's not about me anymore. Eugene Reevy thinks it's not about him anymore. It's not about Joe anymore. It's not about uh, any of the people that we that, that, that we uh, that work with TARP. It's about what's best and how we can avoid this thing. In the future, but that doesn't say that you know that that we will never we will we will never ever stop demanding justice. You see, you know, a demand demanding justice is not incompatible with reconciliation. It's it's yeah they can they're side by side. Um, just truth and justice, and it can never be justice without truth. But um, I will continue to do that. Uh, and sometimes I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm criticised for it. You know, sometimes I'm criticised by somebody who say, "Well, why did you sit down with the UVF?" Sometimes you're criticised uh, because, you know, why did you sit down with with the uh, Republicans? Why did you talk to them because they were responsible? And uh, there've been times when you know, victims uh, and sometimes high profile victims will, you know, will criticise you because they find it, you know, incomprehensible. That, that you can do that. But I, I think that the fact that, you know, 
I've I've always, you know, held the view that you know this this wasn't for me. It wasn't personal. Uh, this was I was just a pawn in this awful game. Um, but uh, hopefully we can make a difference. You know, uh, I don't have the key to, to you know to to peace and 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 uh, all of the all of the wonderful things that we need to do before we have a successful. Uh, United Ireland or a successful relationship or whatever way this thing pans out. Um, but, you know, as long as there's integrity there and, and that we, we do our best and we, we don't do it for the wrong reasons, then uh, uh, I will continue to meet them, yeah. You, you you touched on something very fascinating there. I'll, I'll I'll bring you back to you. Don't mind. You, you you said that during during filming of a particular scene in the in the documentary when when you spoke to a like an F a, an ex UVF um, person, you you said there were those uh, off camera, but but they were trying to they were in, in trying to in some way trying to influence or or pervert the, the interview. No. Do, do you mean yeah? Do, do, do you mean like 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 during? During one of the questions, they they were cutting in or, or something. No, no, no. Uh, um, those people weren't trying to influence that. They were just trying to make sure that there was no uh, that that there was nothing compromising uh, said because you know you've got to be very careful when you say you know uh, what we were saying there was that that the man I spoke to was a representative of the was speaking for the organisation. We're not going to say anything other than that. Um, uh, that that it was so. You see, these are dangerous. It's dangerous to have some of these conversations because there are people that can that can you know use them against you. And I'm fully aware of that. So there's no way that 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 we're going to put anybody in danger. Um, and there were people there that were making sure that something you know wasn't. But there was nothing said that you know that uh, that so nobody had to step in. Nobody had to say anything. And as I say, you know, when there was an attempt, as you'll see in the documentary, to to mitigate this and to say you know, the the thing was that nobody was supposed to die on the on, on that morning, that it was simply to send a message to the south that they could they could touch anywhere. I closed that down very quickly uh, by saying, without being rude, I just said, uh, forensic uh, reports and uh, show that that wasn't the case. It was uh, you know, we wouldn't have been past Newry. When this this happened, so, um, but it didn't didn't progress into that uh, any further. You know, the man agreed with me. Yeah, look, let's talk and see what we can, you know, what we can work out and what we can do to uh, ensure that something like this never happens again. And I, I you know, people may sound, think it's 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 that bit strange when I say it showed incredible courage on their uh, uh, from them to actually engage with this because. You know, once the filming is done, you're handing it over to somebody then to, uh, you know, that they can cut it or, and, you know, and make it look whatever way, you know, uh, sensational headlines. But they didn't. These were filmmakers of the highest integrity. And they what they what they simply did was they showed the truth. You know, there was there was no bias. And they when they came across to uh, to film with us, um, there was they just wanted to be a fly on the wall and and to see what you know how how these engagements were taking place of course having a meeting with uh we would have liked to have had a meeting with the craftsman uh on film that's not to say that he you know that that we didn't have a meeting with we would have liked to have a meeting with senior people we certainly would have liked to have had a meeting with the people who who spent time in jail with it you know not to berate them or not to say, you know, you shouldn't have done this or how dare you or anything like that. It's, it's, I don't make these films uh, or the podcasts like this. For me, I make it for you. John. I make it for all of the people out there. I know the story. I know what happened. I know all of these things. But it's so that, you know, if, if we do nothing, only start a conversation about this. And that there are some people who will say, you know, I think you're going about this the right way. Well, that's fine. You know, we've we're, we're, we've 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 been successful with this, and that goes for people who are involved in both sides of the conflict. Uh, and I say both sides, but it also includes, you know, security force members of security force as well who 
who did terrible things too. You know, we mustn't forget that they were not honest brokers. Um, did, did it um did it change your perspectives um your your, your perspective on the attacks um when when you did then begin to accept that that there was um that there was a military involvement there was British government um in, in involvement did, did it uh. Did, did it just make it a different thing in, in, in your mind or was it an attack was an attack? Um, no, uh, it, it, yeah, I did change my mind. But, you know, again, to say change my mind uh, is not exactly accurate because I had no mind on this. I had no view on it. I didn't want to have a view on this. I didn't want to know about collusion. I didn't want to know about these things. I looked at Britain and I said, you know, that's where the Beatles came from. This is my favorite group or the Rolling Stones or the Kings or the Animals or any of these bands. That's what I wanted Britain to be. But, you know, we live in sometimes we can't continue to live in this sort of fairy tale bubble that, you know, that the world is a utopia. Uh, it isn't like that. You know, terrible things are done by people, you know, uh, that. You know, there's a there's a case in Britain there recently where a nurse was killing babies. I don't know if you read that. It was terrible. So you know, because we're inclined to have this sort of one view of some put people in 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 you know in little categories and pigeonholes. And this is a policeman; he wouldn't do anything. This is a nurse who wouldn't do anything. This is a a, a musician that wouldn't uh, that wouldn't know anything other than how to play a bass guitar or something like that. But you know. Uh, Individuals are fascinating creatures, you know, and and uh, there's it's it's interesting to get inside the mind of these people so that we can understand ourselves. I went through, uh, um, you know, I, I didn't I didn't realize that that I had been as badly damaged um, psychologically as I am. Um, PTSD is a terrible thing, but at the time of the incident and at the time when we were when I was supposed to be getting better and uh, been assessed by a psychologist, psychiatrist, um, and people, you know, I thought I'm, I'm being assessed because there's some kind of a, a claim for, you know, some kind of a legal claim that I wanted to get the money back from my guitar that was melted on the night or something like that. You know, I I, I wanted, this was, this was the only reason I thought I was, you know, I was being assessed or getting a psychiatric report. And now years afterwards, for over 48 years afterwards, I realize how important it is to have to have these things because the the damage that it does to people psychologically i never understood what enduring personality meant uh, enduring personality change is you know uh, i didn't i didn't know i never heard that term before about say six or seven years ago when we were going through and uh, the court process that we had to have and then i never knew what imposter syndrome was and things like that um and it's because you now understand these things that you, you look back and you say, the mistakes I made in my life or the, you know, the things that I said and did and how I felt, this is the, this is the reason that I, that I did that. So understanding what happened is one thing. Understanding yourself is very, very valuable uh, as well to understand why you did and why you thought certain things and why. Uh, but one thing I... I can't understand is that uh, I lacked the ability to hate. Um, perhaps it's just a good thing. Yeah, I I, I was going to say that 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 did um that, that did fascinate me when 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 you told me. I I, I think it's especially being a young man. I, I I think it's the it would be like the the initial instinct of, of most young men to to want to kill him or 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 or, or to think about doing it even if um. Even if there were someone who who who, ne who never dealt in violence or, or or killing or anything like that, well, I suppose as part of being uh, a musician uh, and, and an entertainer in some way, I mean, I was a bass a bass player. I never wanted to be in the limelight. Uh, and the bass player's job was to hold down the rhythm to form a, a you know a, a groove. That's the nature of the instrument. But it's in every entertainment entertainer that when you walk on stage, you hope the audience likes you. You know, you hope the uh, and uh, in the cases of Miami, it was like it's the first time that I ever really saw genuine love coming up. And uh, I wanted, I suppose, you know, I, I just 
I just wanted the whole world to love you. And so I, I was I was in, in, inclined to think, you know, well, they do, you know, I'm wrong about this. There isn't, a, these people, they didn't mean it. Uh, and I remember thinking to myself, you know, even the week after it happened while I was still in the hospital, I had this idea that they would have gone home that morning and said, what in the name of God did we just do? I believed that for years, you know, and then when I started to read reports about Jackson killing even the following day, I'm not sure it was the following day or a couple of days afterwards, uh, they weren't sorry. You know, uh, I saw people sort of being nice in the in the dock in the, when they were in court. And once they were sentenced, you know, they just looked at the court, put their hand up and said, no surrender. You know, see, you think to yourselves, you know, who can you, who can you, you believe, you know, or do we simply want to believe the best in people? Uh, and in a way, I'm glad to say that, yeah, I do. I just want to see the best in people. It's very interesting. Um, uh, th thank you very much for, for everything you shared. I, I, I won't keep you too much longer. Um, I, everything um, everything you told us now is greatly appreciated. It's um, serious personal insight. Um, uh, is, there any, is there anything you'd like to leave us with? Just any kind of final thoughts or, or parting words? Um, just, uh, um, I hope people give it s serious consideration, you know, whether or not they agree with you or agree with you, you know, um, what you said, just the, the, the best thing, uh, we ever did was to listen to one another, you know, that that's the best thing. So, um, if you're driving along in a car down some highway in America and you're listening to this, you know, just give it some thought. Um, uh, I may not be right. Uh, you may not agree. You may agree, um, but unless we give these uh, these things, and they are problems, you know, uh, uh, just give them serious thought. I'm I'm currently writing the new book. It's called, and it's more it's more a, a, a personal book than the last one, and it's it's something similar to what we've spoken about. You know, understanding how you feel, how you think, how things impact on you, and how. Uh, uh, how how you can you, you use your experience to help other people so that they won't have that kind of experience. It's actually called the bass player. So uh, because at this stage, you know, anybody could write a book about the Miami show and incident. You could get an AI to do it in ten minutes. You know, but uh, um, there's so much information out there. There's also you know popular misconceptions, and there also uh, there's misinformation, disinformation, whatever. Um, so the new book. Uh, uh, is and I hope to to be in America. Uh, there's a a young man in New York called Paul, um, uh, and uh, Paul is uh, uh, and maybe I'll I'll send you details for him um, uh, so that you can get in touch with him. But I'll be doing a um, uh, and Paul Finnegan, I'll be doing a um, a, a speaking tour. I think. Uh, in the springtime, in uh, I'm sure I'll be in in New York. Oh, very good. Yeah, I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll most certainly come to it. I, I'd love to. Yes, yeah, send me um send me Paul's details to you. Thank you. Yeah. You're well, the best of luck. Uh, Stephen, th thank you very much for for everything. By um, uh, like I said, now everything you shared, I I, I greatly appreciate it. And um, th thank you very much for joining me. You're welcome, John. Uh,